No Jumper, coolest podcast in the world. And today I'm diving deep into the recesses of Boston graffiti lore. I met this dude to my left, Spec. So you're right, I guess. 23 years ago, I was trying to do the math, 24 years ago. Was it 01 or is it? I thought it was like was it... 2000. But you might, you, it, it might 2000. be 2001. You might be right. Yeah, my, my, so 22 years ago. Dang. Pretty crazy because I had no idea who I was meeting at the time. Um, but basically, like, I was on the 12 Ounce Profit forum and I think I met your boy Aves. Yeah. He's the dude yep. that I actually like got in contact with because I was like a 16 year old kid just posting photos from the train yard in my town, which we had a amazing train yard in Nashua, New Hampshire, which I'm sure is probably still pretty good. You can, if you get arrested there, it's not my fault. But um, I was posting about it and probably being a little too forthcoming as like a 16 year old graffiti kid, just being like, yo, this I got the sickest yard. We went there today. We painted for eight hours. We didn't see anybody. And so Aves kind of like reaches out and is like, yo, like, you should show us. And so I go to the mall, Newberry Comics, I believe, the Pheasant Lane Mall. And it's definitely my first time meeting up with like dudes who are well into their 20s, maybe even 30. Yeah. And, yep. And uh, it's Avs, by the way. Aves. Avs. Avs. Okay. Avs. <laughs> well, I've been saying it wrong for 20 years. That's all right. My bad. Um, but yeah, like I had, ne- so we went, we, I remember going to the Home Depot and they were racking right in front of me which i was unbelievably impressed by even though i was doing the same thing but they were a little smoother with it and then uh going to the train yard i don't think i'd ever seen somebody crack a 40 in front of me at like 15 or 16 and i also don't know that i believe a may have been smoked which i don't think i had ever seen anyone do in real life at 15 at that point and and it might have been the first time or it might have been another time after that that you came through and we and we met yeah and And with your boy coda Yes, that's awesome that you remember that. Yes, your your brain is very uh, organized when it comes to. Oh yeah, I I, rem- I remember that too. I remember Coda and Own were up you... for a hot minute. Oh, that's crazy. <laughs> I can't <laughs> believe back. anybody would ever recommend because I still have like a few photos laying around. Yeah, we were so into it, even though my skills were definitely lacking at that time. Yeah, but we were going for it. We still are, dude. You were hard as. F- though like i remember seeing and this is like the most out of out of uh, order interview ever but i remember like you doing a piece and i think or, or starting one that was like i think you would just put sp sometimes you shorten it mm, maybe at the time or yeah, yeah. it might have been the full spec thing but you got frustrated part way through and you ended up just like filling it in because you didn't like the way it looked you kind of just like used like a darker color over the whole thing and then like wrote like a few lyrics on top of it Ooh. or something Probably. That and sounds I'm, about right. I was like, wow, that's the coolest thing ever. Because I was so young that I'm thinking, like, no, every can, like, I need to use it. Like, I can't just give up. Yeah. He, he did that on a train one time. Yeah, this was a train. This was at the train yard, yeah. Yeah, it was, it was, it was a, there was a green BN at Willie's. Yep. And you, you were just having a bad day and, like, you hated your piece and you took S- act, the actual green, the same, bu- the buff color of the car and just buffed your whole thing and went <laughs> home. Oh, buff to say you couldn't even see it at all. Yeah. That must have been. A uh, weird time that in, was, in my career, yeah. That was 01 or 02, because uh, Willie's didn't last much longer. Okay, and so you got to introduce our uh, skeleton-faced friend This here. is Ichabod. Right. Uh, YMAT crew. And you guys have been friends since, for how long? Since uh, 2000, 2000, yeah. Okay, and you were you were living in Boston at the time? Yep. Are you still? You guys both still live out there. Mass. Yep. Okay. Yep. Mass in general. Right. So, all right. Before let, we'll we'll get to the whole part where we uh, eventually met each other. But when? So, take me through like your your early life and how you got fascinated by graffiti because this is we're we're really talking to some lifers here. People who put in ridiculous amounts of time into this. True. Um, basically, in high school, middle school, high school, I would scribble all over the desks and all that. And uh, we, I'd end up going to the city and um, just noticing all the graph on the walls. And I was like, I want to I wanna get down with that. And basically going to hardcore shows, stuff like that, run into people, and then start painting. What, yeah, how much of, 
overlap was there between graffiti and hardcore? Because I feel like it's pretty significant now. Yeah. I I don't I didn't necessarily know about that, but I think there's a lot of scenes where that's pretty common, right? Yeah, in Boston for sure it was, and um, then I I was hooked. What yeah, what that. bands were you going to see when you first started going to hardcore shows? It's like Blood for Blood mm. and uh, Downset, which is native to here. Right. That's um, sick. Yeah, I interviewed uh, White Trash Rob in his attic in Salem, Mass. No way. Yeah, four or five <laughs> years ago. It was pretty thrilling. Um, but okay, so were, were you interested in art before that, though, or did you know yeah, that you had some totally, talent? Totally. Yep. I would sketch all day and... Uh, just took it from there, really. You didn't want to be in a band or anything, though? You just gravitated no, right to the graffiti never. shit? Yeah. But I might have told you that I was in yes. the band, the anniversary. Which, but, like, when you told me that, and I'm, like, 16, because at the time, the, the emo wave and BMX videos at the time was fucking huge. Like, Get Up sure. Kids, Anniversary. Like, I, I probably knew, like, four or five anniversary songs from BMX videos before I even bought an album you know yeah, yeah and so when you told me that my fucking jaw dropped because i don't think i had ever met anybody who was in like one of these bands that i was listening to that you know i'd only knew like the local ska band and shit like that yeah. so when you told me that i couldn't believe it but how did you join that band i didn't oh i lied <laughs> <laughs> but a good friend just to, th to throw me off the scent uh, or, or not intentionally uh, deceiving me I, I do it all the time in the, in the city <laughs> at parties like just talk shit really? whatever but our good friend which you probably know too was actually in that really yes i never actually like looked through the members or anything or did anything to confirm that i'm, um, I'm, I'm glad i don't think i've ever mentioned you being in that band on this podcast because i would hate to have that on the record right but <laughs> it was you know the writer pure I've, I've seen that yeah yeah he was the guy okay which when we were painting that yard, he was there with us with Cam. Right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Wow. So were you always a bit of a troll or, or was it like you kind of intentionally wanted to deceive people so they wouldn't be able to get an idea of who you were? I guess so. I, I don't even know. I think I was just fucking around. Right. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> Interesting. So how did you go about actually getting into graffiti? What were you painting on early on? It was just walls in my hometown. And in 99, I met this dude, Arson. Who I also met when I first linked up with you up guys, there, yeah. yeah. And he introduced me to trains. And then from there, it was all trains. Were you guys hitting the, the subways in Boston, or were you just... Uh... That's that's later on. Okay. But we we did, and that's how it went downhill for me. And I did six months. But that was for the subways. Okay, was that later on though? When you had this arrest, that was that's all. When 07. you Google you, oh, 07. so there's oh seven because you got caught again in like or no like oh seven. Yeah, that yeah. was it. Yep. So okay, you've been paying freights and shit for a long time. Freights and then yeah, the subways was like oh four, and it was just and the city as well. So it was like city, subways, freights, but they came after me for. The subways. Just because it's so much more attention getting at this point? Yeah. And actually, this year is the 20 years we did a, 20 years ago, we did a whole car on the red line and the blue line, actually, too. Uh huh. So. How long was that stuff running for when you would do it? On the subways? Yeah. No, nah, they'd buff it like right away. Next day, but yeah, you, yeah. you would get photos usually? Yes. But that's not true because. On the commuter rails, they would let them run sometimes for two months. Really? On the commuters. Yep. And so was that just incredibly fulfilling when yes, you would get yes, one that would yeah, last I'd that long? I'd ride it, take it out all the way out the city. Damn. Yeah. That's crazy. But uh, so you you didn't get caught for a long time. Like how long did you actually go before you got caught? So 99 to I'd had I had a little arrests here and there. But they never caught me for my name. But uh, so 99, that's when you started. So when no, I met no. you, you had only been doing it for a couple of years. No, so 95. Okay. Basically. And then they like I I started getting in trouble more. So like 
uh, I'd say oh five or four or five. What would you blame that for? You just going just way harder, being reckless, like drinking at bars and. That'll get just, you, huh? Just painting. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Taking a can to the to the bar zone and like just catching a few hands while bar hopping is how, yeah. a, lot, how a lot of people go down. That's I, I have a lot of friends who do that, and it's very very worrisome as the person who's not doing graffiti and just like seeing them do that. Yeah. yeah. So it's good and bad because you you can get up really well casually. You're, you know, you're feeling, blending feeling in. Feeling good about it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you're loose. Yep. It's like a car crash. When you're drunk, you're more likely to survive. Yeah. Maybe. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, yeah. so you just started kind of fucking around like that. And like, I don't know, what what would you say was driving you at that point, though? Like, was it the... Just seeing other other people's shit. And just wanting to outdo them? to replicate it, outdo it. It's definitely competitive. Mm. Yeah. Were you stealing most of your supplies at that time? Back then, yes. Now, not so much, but but it's it, I'm still loving it, still having a good time. Right. But uh, in terms of the stealing cans, how would you go about it back in the day? Like, And what, what were your most prolific sources? AC Moore. Yeah. Uh, hand carts, hand baskets. Just walk right out the door. Right. Yeah. Yeah, the security was pretty astonishingly low at that point. In time, it's almost hard for, for me sure. to imagine. I, I wonder. I wonder if it's still like that. I don't really know. Well, yeah. also the uh, the minimum wage was on the low side, so like the people who were charged, the people who were supposed to like say, "Hey, what are you doing?" were just like, "I don't get paid enough," <laughs> whatever. <laughs> yeah, I remember like they had these black balls in the ceiling that everybody was scared of, and I knew like one kid who worked there who told me that they were speakers and that they weren't uh, cameras or anything. Just fakes. Yeah. yeah, and then so after that, it was really on. Like I was, I mean, even in the local, like uh, Home Depot at that time, there was no cameras. And I remember yeah. a few years later them putting cameras in and being like, "Oh, okay, so that's kind of the end of an era." Yeah, the winter, you just jock the cans in your jacket right in here. How many do you think is the most you ever got in one trip? Would Probably. you like fill up the shopping cart, or no. was it always on your body? I've never done a shopping cart; just the hand baskets. Right. Yeah. What do you think? You got like 15, 12 or something? 20, maybe. 20 maybe. on your body? No, no, in the basket. Well, yeah, in my, yeah. Probably like six. That's pretty six, impressive. Six, yeah. What about you? You got any uh, tails? <laughs> I, I wasn't much into racking. Um, when the self-checkout came into being, I may have inadvertently made a few errors here and there on how many things I was buying. But, you know, mm. uh, mostly I... Um, I would I would hunt around for like deals. Uh, I used to go around to um, most of the mom and pop hardware stores are gone now. Mm. But back when they were a thing, before they all got corporate and became chains, right? Um, you know the old places with the the hard the wood floors and the narrow aisles and the the dust on the products and stuff. The ones that we should have felt bad about ripping off. Right, yeah, exactly. Right. <laughs> I would I would go and I wouldn't even rack them. I'd just walk in and be like, I notice you're not selling this paint. You know, like it's it's gathering dust. Uh, right. If you want to, you know, mark these down, I'll buy the whole shelf. You know, like. And for some reason, a whole bunch of store owners were more than happy. They're like, how about a dollar a can? I'm like, all right, give me a box. Wow. And I so I pulled that at a lot of places. Um, I just kind of nickel and dimed. I didn't I didn't I never like pushed a card or like tried any any big stuff. But there's got to be small. writers out there who have looked into getting like wholesaler accounts so they could just buy it. We did that, too. You did really? Mm -hmm. Yep. And that um, worked out. How much are you getting cans for at a certain point? um we got a few pallets that were you know like with shipping like a dollar a can wow like good rust-oleum so uh it that's was, crazy it was worth doing Damn. but um yeah we we eventually uh worked our way up to that angle too so Damn. um i kept it i i estimate um i've looked at my receipts for like basically my whole painting career since like 2000 and uh i think i've saved about half I've spent only half of what I should have spent. Really? Off of like full retail. Wow. What what are your like current methods for getting it inexpensive? Um, I kind of don't even want to say cuz I'm <laughs> still still working them a little bit and you know, it's it's nothing it's no major crimes, just a little little nickel and dime here and there. 
that makes sense. And and still still work on the wholesale angle from time to time. Let me ask you this though. I I used to hit building nineteen. Remember that? Yep. Is oh, it yeah. still around? I don't know. Uh, I don't know. But, Is it? No, building building nineteen. Uh, well, they don't carry paint anymore. Really? Okay. Another another chain like took over buying all the the spray paint in the in the like New England. But I remember getting paint from there, which was like unbelievably easy to steal, and then it would be like the worst quality. Paint. it was, was just it shit wet? that i hadn't encountered besides that and it was i was kind of like fuck is this even worth it like can i really use this for anything yeah never never rack off brands just get the good stuff <laughs> <laughs> that makes sense um okay so w w would you consider this like the magazine era like when did the magazine era in terms of like how graffiti artists judge themselves or like what was considered the dominant media of the time like it was magazines and, and vhs tapes were the back, primary thing back, back then. then yes for sure uh what do you say in the 90s yeah um i remember like um it was on the go and like some other a couple of others i didn't i didn't um i wasn't that dude like at tower records all the time like waiting for stuff to drop i tower just came records. across a few things <laughs> yeah but um, like I, I got some of the twelve ounce profit, the early ones they put out. Mm. Yeah, I remember going to Tower Records in Boston and buying, you know, like twenty fucking graffiti magazines, like in in one stop there. And when I think about it now, it is kind of weird to think about. Like Tower Records had relationships with just like dozens of different graffiti magazines. Like it's such a strange concept. But then you think about all the other magazines that they were selling as well, which is kind of crazy to consider at this point in time. Yeah. That was on Newberry Street? I think so, yeah. Yeah. And even all the Tower Records are gone pretty much now. I think there's like yeah. one or two in America left. Or there's one in Japan I've seen. Really? Pretty sure. If I'm uh, lying, it's gonna seem stupid as fuck. The uh but that's where you go to meet writers. Really? Uh, at the top of Newberry and Mass Ave in the 90s. You just knew where they would be hanging you out just at? Well, where the magazines are sold. Right. You know. Do you feel like the internet has kind of like fundamentally changed and distorted what you loved about graffiti? Or do you feel like it just adds to it? I think it's... Yeah. It's both. It's a, yeah, a double-edged sword. Um. It's although a lot of people like to complain about the internet, but it's kind of, it was kind of inevitable. Mm. You take a culture, you take a subculture like we got, and you you put the you put a new paradigm in place in the society. It's it's gonna change. So there's a, there's a lot of a lot of bad shit happened because of the internet, and um, you know regional styles got dissolved. Mm. The system of mentoring people in person. Like back then, you had to like meet somebody and like learn like you know what caps go on what cans or how to how to develop a style or something. And somebody would like they'd haze you, and then if you had the right attitude, they might take you under their wing and and show you a few things. Sometimes <laughs> grudgingly, sometimes you know because they they like doing it. Right. But now it's like there's there's kids that are good in like six months. Because they can look everything up on the they internet. They just bite it. They bite it. Yeah. Because yeah. I mean, even me meeting up with you and those dudes back in uh, 2001 was like very improbable. It was like probably some of the earlier like online meetups. You know, there's probably there were like people doing. I'm sure people were meeting each other on Photo Bucket or whatever. But it was kind of new. Like I'm sure 12 months profit had only even been out for a couple of years at that point. What year? Uh, in 2001. Yeah, it was. I was, uh, I was on there in like '98. And uh, to be honest, I didn't even meet the first my first writer in in person. I actually like was talking with somebody on the internet, and uh, we were in the same town. And that was my boy Learn, who founded Why Me Crew. Mm. Um, I think I remember meeting him too. Yeah, he um, we we did the little you know, are you a cop? Are you not a cop? Dance <laughs> on there for a couple of a couple of messages, and then we agreed to meet up, and uh, and the re the rest of that's history. Yeah, it's crazy because, I mean, when you when you look at it like a graffiti writer's Instagram, for me as somebody who's like very much outside of it, it's like this is an unbelievably efficient way for me to see what they're up to. You know, you, can, yeah. you don't even have to click. You can just kind of see from a glance at like what the type of stuff that they're posting is and then you can click and, and zoom in and like get a better look at it and stuff. But yeah, I had that same feeling because uh, my, my girl bought me a bunch of markers and, and uh, spray paint cans one year for my birthday and I was kind of like, 
this is like kind of a fucked up thing for you to do because I'm gonna get myself in trouble if you really yeah. like give me this shit. Like she's like, well, you could just do it on like a regular wall or whatever. I'm like, where where am I gonna find a regular wall? Like True. either way, but like so I I get curious and I go on YouTube and I start looking up like you know how to do graffiti and shit and start just watching random fucking videos and I'm like. If I had these videos when I was 16, right, I would have right. been able to get so much better, so much faster. And now I lack the uh, enthusiasm to actually probably go through with it. But yeah, it's unbelievable how much, how fast. I and mean, when you're watching somebody wearing a fucking GoPro doing the exact thing that essentially that you want to be doing, and you can see exactly what it's going to look like through your eyeballs while you're doing it, it's like, it's, it's hard to imagine sticking with it if you couldn't figure that out like it's just so efficient yeah the, the price of that though is um something like uh it, it can get generic yeah so a lot of people are all rocking the same style or the same non-style or lately the same anti-style which uh <laughs> i'm not too down with but right. describe that for me um i use the term anti-style some people call it hipster graffiti but it's basically stuff that's bad on purpose like mm. it looks like a kindergartner did it even though the people who are doing it may actually know how to paint. They like make it look ugly on purpose. And they get, but they get up in good yeah. places with it. Yeah, sometimes. But I'm just like, ah, get a get a real style. Would you I say like you? Stuff. Would you say you universally hate uh, like street art, or is it just there's a lot of it that's whack? Actually, no, I don't. Not not universally. I'll judge everything. I judge art. I judge graffiti on like uh, the visual. Like I'll look at it and be like, oh, that's actually cool. Even if the, even if the, you know, even if it was like a stencil or something, like, mm. um, I don't hate on Banksy. A lot of, a lot of graffiti writers hate on Banksy because he used stencils or because it was just street art and he didn't do real graffiti, which is about writing your name. Um, but he did some cool shit as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. I mean, graffiti evolving past just writing your name seems like a pretty natural progression, you know? And I, I say that as somebody who generally is like pretty much a traditionalist and i would probably rather look at stuff that's a little bit more old school but i mean it would have been bizarre if we made it to 2023 without that happening yeah i don't know but do you think do you think like like i mean what what is it that there has to be this conflict between like traditional graffiti and street art though is it just because they occupy the same spaces because it feels like it's a very different group of people that would like most graffiti writers wouldn't gravitate towards that and vice versa i feel like the street artists are art school kids mm. more so um yeah there's a there's an element of that there's an element of um some of the purists in favor of letter forms and traditional graffiti um value like having a set of balls and like going out there and painting your name and doing like you know in the old days in new york they were like they clowned you if you had th only three letters in your name because that didn't be take in as and long out. you'd be in and out quicker <laughs> so um with street art like if people are just wheat paste and stuff or just running out there and doing a quick stencil and running away it didn't take them long mm. whereas if you're writing traditional graffiti you have to you have to sketch it you got to fill it you got to outline it you got to add your doodads um, and, and you're risking it longer mm. and you're, you're risking it harder. So there's, there's, there's an element of that, I think in the, in the, um, a little bit of like discrimination against street art. Yeah, that makes sense. I remember, I remember when I first got started too, that I was pretty much almost exclusively painting on trains. And then at some point somebody told me like, you know, trains are way harder to paint on. And right. I was like, oh, right. This shit is dripping a lot. And I, like, I never really thought about the absorption that was going on on a wall that made it a lot easier in general but do you like compare the two like do you feel like trains are that much dramatically difficult they're, more difficult they're difficult yes but they're they travel mm. and we could you could see them in any city so you paint it in nashua and it could be here Definitely, yeah. You know. No, it's easy to understand why. Because that was like the internet before the internet. It was like if it was going to travel around. People wouldn't have to come to your hometown to see it. It's just like, I don't know. Like If you could compare it, like how, mu how much more difficult is painting a train versus painting a wall? The wall like goes all the way to the ground. So like that bottom couple of feet, I sometimes... <laughs> <laughs> right. When I, when I do a wall, I'm like, oh, yeah, I got to put a bottom on this thing. Right. But... um. But no, trains trains have a lot of stuff sticking out. They got ridges, they got rivets, they got 
various appurtenances sticking off that you got to paint and go around. So there's a, it's a little more of a challenge painting a 3D surface. I feel a lot like of the walls are just pretty smooth. But I feel like the biggest difference is just the 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 slipperiness of the metal versus like a wall. Yeah, the paint will drip a little faster on the metal. So but you as gotta, you become you gotta an, have can control. Yeah, if you become an expert, is that less of a factor? Like as you get better. Yeah, totally. I yeah. see. Okay, interesting. Um, okay, so let's let's get closer to the time period where you got caught. So so you had been caught multiple times, but you hadn't. They Never. had no reason to suspect that you were spec. Right, and they just threw me out, and then I showed up at court. Yada yada. It was it was a slap on the wrist. Mm. But when they got you in 2007, it was not a slap I, on the wrist. No, I was sentenced. And how I was how did they in catch Salem you? At the time. Yeah, too. right. Because that was in the, some of the news articles that specify that there was a lot of your shit in Salem, Mass. Right. Right. Yeah. Wait. So, how did they go about catching you? Did they have to put together like a whole investigation? Fifteen months. Yeah. Really, and they were following you, or how was it going? I guess. I. I Honestly, I don't know. They may have had a confidential informant. Ooh. <laughs> do, you, do you think so? You think that? I, I don't know. Maybe. Really? That must be. Is that was it kind of scary though that it could For have sure. been almost anybody you knew? Mm, well, it was definitely no close friends. Maybe somebody I went over, you know, dissed or whatever. I mean, it's easy to imagine. Right. Out here making enemies all the time. One of them could easily decide to just roll over on you. I wouldn't say graffiti has uh, necessarily the same degree of like self policing that there seems to be in hip hop, where snitching is this like obsession. Mm. I don't know. It's, it, I'm sure it would be a big deal in graffiti, but I don't know that people are really talking about it that much. No, it's it's a big deal. You you don't snitch. Um, yeah, for but sure. but some kids some kids. And it might be like you know some kid you met at a party who was jocking you or whatever, and you you let on who you you let on your identity to this kid. He goes out later, and paints, and he gets caught red-handed. Mm -hmm. And then the the cops are asking him the question like, "Who's so and so? Do you know so and so?" Because we're trying to get this other guy, and they offer him a a deal or something if, right. if he'll if he'll give up what he knows about us. And then it's like, well, see, but that's what's interesting about that is that. The snitching conversation in like hip hop or street culture or whatever is always about well, it's not really snitching unless it's somebody that you agreeingly got into a, a criminal arrangement with, essentially, which also extends to your enemies and stuff. Like if your enemies shoot up your house, you're not allowed to snitch on your enemies for shooting your house. That's that's part of it as well. But it's kind of in graffiti, it's kind of different because these people aren't really attached to each other in any way. Everybody's kind of like an island, and very few people. Well, there's crews and stuff like that. But it feels like it would be harder to police people snitching because it's just all these like random one on one interactions with the cops. Well, it's still a, it's still disrespectful to the culture to, for sure. to be like that. Definitely. So, OK, like w how did they bust you? How they arrest you? Uh, so they raided the house and I was at work at the time. And I, I, I left work and my boss calls and he said, all these cops were here, and I'm like, oh. So I, I bounced out to my boy's house for the weekend. And your boss had no idea you were a graffiti artist? Well, he did. Oh, he, he did. did. Oh, yeah. He cued me in <laughs> that they were there and all that. And uh, so my boys took all my photos out of my apartment at the time and hid it. And then I had to turn myself in unfortunately mm. wow but then yeah it was wild them getting rid of all the photos never came back to bite you no i was like destroying evidence or anything no. like that nope i still have it all okay but so okay you turn yourself in and then what what goes down how does this work out so it's, and then for the next year i'm going to every single courthouse in Massachusetts because really? you had stuff in every different district, county yeah. and district yeah and so I took a year and then finally they they sentenced me to the six six months and so what was your legal defense or did you I, I got a lawyer right but but and were you trying to argue that you weren't spec or was it so obvious at that point that you didn't even I think it was that more so yeah. Mm. 
Because what do you do? You hire the, they have like handwriting experts and shit to prove it's you, right? Or like, how are they able to prove that it was well, you? Well, there's a, there's the experts are the Vandal Squad, right? And they're in Boston at the time. They were pretty heavy. They they knew about everybody. So right, they tried to get you to snitch on people. Yeah, and yeah. I did not. <laughs> they ever get tough? You're in there sweating in the nah, in the booth. I was just like. No comment. <laughs> right. So what was that six months like? It was easy, but coming out was the harder part because you can't get a job with a felony because it's a felony in mass. Um, can't get a job. So they made it tough. You lose your license for a year. Wow. All that. And so how did you kind of get around all that? How did you make it out of that? And also, though, I was on a five-year probation, mm. and, like, you you can't fuck up at all in, in five years. But it, I don't know. I I made it out. I'm here. I got good art jobs from that whole thing. So with the attention of the case kind of, like, yeah. got you in a lot of people's minds in terms of hiring you to art, do shit? Art collectors, yeah. Really? Mm-hmm. Damn, so you felt like your work all of a sudden became a lot more prized as a result of the controversy? Absolutely, yeah. Really? Mm -hmm. He also got a couple of freight panels done uh, while he was in jail because we we did a few for him. Oh, really? <laughs> so what, you guys just like emulated his shit exactly? No, I did. I did like a. I did his name in my style. I did okay. a TikTok on a train. Would that be disrespectful if he did your name like in your style? No. Nah. Or is that... No, we, all we, it's it's all crew, like it's all love. So that we 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 fool around. I remember one time, like four of us went to a spot, and there was one good long box car. We were all like, "Hey, let's swap names. Like <laughs> you you do my name in your style." And it was uh, it was me, learn, lack, and journey. And uh, so we all so I did like a learn piece in a TikTok, and learned did a a, a lack piece in his style. And Journey did my name in a in a dope style that I liked, and uh, Lack was the only guy who didn't quite grasp the program. He did a perfectly counterfeit Journey piece in Journey style because <laughs> he didn't really grasp like the concept. Right. But it was it was a good looking train. It was hilarious. Wow, that's funny. Yeah, that. Uh, damn, I could I could uh, I could see that being pretty dope. Yeah. There was one time though, in the Nashua yard. Where we got we chased run. out. Yes. Do you remember this? Yes. And it was, the snow was this deep. And when I tell these stories on this podcast, I almost feel like I'm lying because it sounds so like ridiculous that I would be in this situation at like 16. But I'm glad that you can verify that oh, this yeah. actually happened. And okay, so my memory is that this was a day in which we were probably in there for like six hours plus. Yeah. And I remember, day. I remember Kem's doing a whole train like top to bottom with a fucking ladder. He probably had it 90 percent done. He probably had like just a few black lines finishing the outline at the very top and then all of a sudden these fucking SUVs pull up yes. and everybody else is paying too I think you guys had done a bunch of like uh, Panels. Yeah, yeah yeah everybody going was, crazy wasn't it like you rolled eight deep that day was, or something was eight. Yeah. <laughs> we were very comfortable there because we were we were going there for long ass periods of time and not getting kicked out or anything and it was kind of like we were probably too comfortable I just remember falling in the snow and all the paint was just like sliding across the ice. It was pretty crazy that we were able to just run through the woods to our cars and get out of there. Yeah. Like it just seems like if they were smart, they would have been able to get us. But hmm. I remember like jumping into a train and, and thinking like, oh, I'm going to hide here. And then I'm like hearing all you guys run and I'm in there for like a minute. And I'm just like, oh, this is fucking stupid. I got to get <laughs> out of here and just run it for my life. But uh, yeah, that's that's crazy. I don't know. It's it's weird for me to think that I had like only so many of those types of days, but that you pretty much been like living that kind of shit to, to this day <laughs> ever <laughs> since. Yeah. yeah. So okay, when you get out and you're on probation, did did they scare you straight for a mm -hmm. period of time? For a period of time, yes. Right. But I just I love it too much. So how long can you honestly say you didn't paint for after the six months? A mm, couple of years. Really? Two years. I said, yeah, two. But it, it was just an itch? Was it like drugs? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> he he yeah. wanted to go out. He had two two weeks left. 
on five years of probation and he wanted to go out. I'm like, dude, <laughs> I'm not taking you to this spot today. Wait two weeks. Don't, don't fuck it up at this this late in the game. But Just that's what I'd be crazy for you because on one hand, you want to go paint with them so bad. It's been so long. And then on the other hand, you're a fucking total asshole if you're like really pushing him to do it, right? It's got to be a weird balance. Um, I, I try to go with the, the smarter, more conservative <laughs> play in that particular situation. Right. But so then once you uh, got done with the probation and everything, uh, how did you have to switch your shit up in order to survive uh what do you mean like like i mean did, did you have to change your name or no well i i started going more towards like the piecing rather like on walls rather right. than that and still trains here and there but i couldn't do subways i couldn't do bombing right. in the city all that but you kept the same name kept and just name. right in terms of like was doing pieces like that was it equally fulfilling now now, now it is, it is yeah. did it take you a while to get there because i felt like your style back in the day was kind of antithetical to that that you were about just bombing and doing throw ups more simple yeah yeah and now so that's the way i had to take it basically mm. and now i'm just i'm doing more piecing styles All right does it does it feel like a compromise to you know it feels do good. stuff that's safer it kind of feels good yeah like I'm just kind of like relaxing more so, focusing on art more. Getting out of that like young vandal mind state that realistically yep. is going to be hard to hold but down in the long run. Still sticking around, you know, here and there. I, I feel like you could be totally lying to me and you might be getting up all the time. I don't know. <laughs> I'm okay with it either mm. way. <laughs> well, all right, where, where do you feel like you're at in the game now? Because if, if graffiti is a weird thing to, to grow old in, right? Um, yeah, but, um, it's not probably, that anyone here is old, but, well, I, I started late. I'm old. I, I started late. Um, yeah, I, I tell people like, oh yeah, man, you've been out for a while. I'm like, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not old school. I'm just old. Um, but no, I started late. Um, I found graffiti late and, um, um, I'm, I'm still in it at this late date. Uh, cause I love it. So. Mm. I, most mostly i love the trains i do walls i do some i do some spots here and there and uh i think even after i have to hang up all the cans i will always want to take like a silver uni and go right on something that's rusty metal because mm. i just love that i love that flow i love that feeling yeah when you but, guys uh, come I'm, to... I'm, I'm i'm still going strong i got six thousand freights and i'm i'm still at it so you're keeping track oh yeah you I've, have photos of all of them not photos okay um i just keep track you can keep track of the um you can get every car by the ID number, the reporting mark, and the ID number of the car. Uh -huh. And I, I have them all recorded. Really? Since since 2000, yeah. So you write down the car that you did it on, even though realistically the car is probably getting painted over at some point. Um, yeah, just as a just as a marker, like, I, yeah, I did this. And it was way back when, um, when I was first getting into freights. I mean, I started painting in 97, but I was a toy for like two, three years. Mm -hmm. uh, barely. I, I didn't even meet learn until 99. Um, but I was um, I was hearing people who were already up on freights, you know, given estimates of how many freights they've done. Right. And they were like, oh, yeah, I probably got 500. I probably got 1,000. And I'm like, I wonder if there may be padding that number a little bit, mm -hmm. either deliberately or accidentally. So I'm like, I wonder what it would be like to actually keep track from the beginning. Mm. So in 2000, I decided to get serious about freights, and I started recording all the information about them. I remember. And I, start, I, I started to, like, get an idea of, like, yeah, I think people are inflating their numbers because I'd get, I'd mm. get stuck at, like, you know, the, it took forever to get from 600 to 700. <laughs> you know, like, right. I'd, I'd, do, I'd do a bunch at a couple weekends in a row. I'd go hard for a, a summer month, and then, like, I'd do my paperwork and be like, man, I'm only 635. I feel like I haven't. Uh... I haven't thought about this since then, but I remember we went to Wendy's and uh, the, in Nashua, and I remember, like, you guys were talking about getting to 1,000 freights. Oh, like yeah. a thousand was like a number that everybody there yeah. was kind of like, yeah, like may maybe I'll stop when I get to a thousand. Like I, I, I'm just trying to get to a thousand. Yep. You know, which and sounds funny now because that was 20 years ago. I'm sure everybody who was there exceeded that. Yeah, there was a few. There's probably like three years that we were up to like 
two fifty a year. And that was the meat for me, but not this guy. But yeah, because I mean, you think about a thousand. I mean, it's like, like you said, two fifty. I mean, doing a piece nearly every day. That's a lot for fucking four years. I mean, that's insane. Even just the money that it would cost you, even if you paid half for your paint or whatever, I mean, it's gonna cost you a fortune. Dedication. Yeah, for real. Well, I, I'm I'm blessed because I don't have a whole lot of side um, expenses. Like mm. I um, I spend money on like good food and spray paint and you know i don't gamble i don't drink i don't do a lot of i don't really do drugs um i mean you know maybe dmt once a year but um uh i don't like shop a lot or buy stuff or have an expensive car or anything so all i spend money on is like good food good coffee and spray paint right definitely yeah i uh i'm kind of the same way where it's like i just don't really i have a hard time thinking anything to spend my money on but I also don't spend on those spray paint, so. <laughs> um, okay, but so when when you look at that whole time period, were there any other times where you, like, took time off as a result of just trying to, like, just life getting in the way? Or were you, like, super consistent throughout the whole time that you've been doing this? Uh, well, just after the jail thing, I had a kid mm. as well. So that death slowed me down. What are the freight spots that, like, when you're talking about paying that consistently, like, what what kind of spots have you guys had, and how how laid back are they? Um, well, the, the first rule of spots is you don't name the spots. <laughs> right, well, yeah, but, yeah, no, really don't name no it. Names. Yeah, we we blew Nashua. We already blew Nashua's I've, train. Here I've, right I've actually only done Nashua a handful of times. Really, just, probably maybe a half dozen times, just because it's a little bit of a hike. Yeah, but um, yeah, um, we've got usually you have like a. You know, like a, I used to do this sweep, like I'd drive around to like, you know, we had 10 or 12 different spots all in like a few hours drive and you'd check one. And if it wasn't laid up, you'd drive to the next one. And the, the first one that that had something good in it, you'd park and go in and do your thing. Right. Um, that's changed a bit. A lot of the spots, especially in New England, like a lot of, you know, the U.S. doesn't manufacture as much as it used to. So mm. a lot of a lot of branch lines dry up get rusty turn into rail trails customers Mm -hmm. disappear or switch to trucks so it's rough but um in the last 10 years i've done a lot more traveling around north america and and hitting freights um you know in other less likely places you're more likely to meet up with some locals that already know the lay of the land or just show up and just do your own thing uh either way sometimes i reach out and network um if i can't network i'll go to a town by myself and i'll i'll treat the spot like it is actually maybe somebody's spot already Mm. like you know don't leave cans don't leave any evidence go in hit my spread it out a little bit don't hit every car and just maybe nobody even knows i was there right i've i've also been rolled or rolled up on some locals while they were doing the spot right and uh you know met some people that way and good vibes or do you go into it like expecting a conversation um i just most of the most of the times i ran into people at spots were like on the more recent side when i've I've already established my name mm. so people would know who i was and that the trip that when i told them who i was they'd be like oh shit what right. are you doing here it's like, just got to be weird as fuck because you're walking up and like they don't know if you're undercover or, or whatever and at the same time you don't want to fucking announce yourself like my name is like you know like that's kind of awkward too yeah, i learned i learned one day with this guy at a layup in i think uh 2001 i learned that like if you roll up on your own boys like and they didn't know you were coming because it was like before cell phones like one of the things you don't say is yo <laughs> <laughs> then we all run <laughs> yeah these these there were two the, this guy was it arson i think so yeah yeah those those two were there and they they just heard some guy yell yo and and they just ran and hid and it took a few minutes for us to like figure it out yeah. But so so when I walk up on somebody now and I know they're writing, I know they're writers and I want them to know I'm a writer. I just take out a if there's if there's no reason to be like ultra stealthy at that moment, I'll just pick take out a can and shake it as I walk up on them. That is the and symbol. when they look, they'll be like, oh, OK, I feel like there's writes. like an equivalent to that with like Native American chiefs or something that they, they then they have some kind of like noise making instrument. Well, I'm sure they probably had all kinds of noise making instruments, but that I feel like there's got to be a historical precedent for that. <laughs> mm. Announcing yourself. So, I mean, 
where where are you at in terms of like he's talking about how he prefers doing legal stuff more or even doing like paid jobs and stuff are you are you fucking with that kind of stuff as well um yeah i got some i got some like art commissions and some you know mural type jobs and stuff and i i take those when i can get them and uh but um, I still just love the freights. Mm. I just love freights, and I love traveling. And when I travel, I will get up on uh, stationary objects, and you know, other than steel, yeah, in, in, in different cities. I remember I went to uh, the island Guadalupe one time with my girl for a week, and it was so obvious to me that some out of towners had showed up and gone on vacation and just done shit all over the fucking island. Yeah, and it was so sick to see, and also just kind of bizarre to think that like this whole island had this like graffiti vibe going as a result of like really two or three names that i just kept seeing over and over and over yeah and it just kind of blew my mind like these dudes just went on vacation and god knows how many fucking spray paint cans they brought with them or purchased it it, it goes back to the heart of why graffiti is even fun it's like kilroy was here like i i came through yeah and i'll go to far away places and be like oh there's oh there's there's jabber oh there's erupto i know that dude you know like this this so-and-so and And it's 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 sometimes it's subtle stuff like i've seen you know scribes in the on the gas station mirrors at like truck stops Mm. and stuff and in the middle of nowhere um i've i've seen like whiteout tags on curb stones and i'm like i know that dude (laughs) right it's just a trip to see people's names up in the cuttiest, weirdest spots. Okay. Do you ever think about this? What is the like the legacy that you kind of leave behind as a graffiti writer? Because on one hand, you spend your whole career trying to remain as low as possible. And then, you know, at one point you die and there's not much of like a public record connecting you to this work or whatever. You ever think about that? Or you ever think about like compiling, like, especially with you keeping track of all your freights at some point, you ever think about like, maybe you would leave some kind of like tomb by which all this stuff could be remembered by, or is it more supposed to be of the moment? The, um, I think one gen, I think the most logical uh, path is that one grows into the other. You start off in the moment and you have, if you put a, put to string together enough moments, you got a legacy and mm. then um maybe you could like put a book out or or you know do some do some stuff with that and, and let people know your name and would you want your kids to know about all the graffiti that you do well like, i don't i don't have any kids but if you uh, got that <laughs> sure yeah why not right yeah, i i would i would totally uh if if i had kids i would i would totally be like yep this is what i do this is you know stay off the train tracks until i show you all the right stuff <laughs> Because it's dangerous. Yeah. But, you know, I, I, I'm not uh, not ashamed in the least of what I do. I'm proud of what I do. Right. It's just, you know, it's illegal, so I got to keep it on the low. Is there anything about graffiti that's, that seems different to you as you get older and become a little bit more of a responsible adult? Yes. Like like writing on churches, like just stupid stuff. Right. Yeah, I've gotten more conservative and more picky about yeah. what spots I'll paint. I want to make sure it's either derelict or a train or a generic thing like a bridge. Mm. I'm not trying to uh, try to you know etch the windows of a mom and pop store. They're just you know because now I'm in the generation where a lot of my friends run businesses, right? And they they you know their back door got tagged, and they they call me up and be like, you know this guy, tell him to like tell him to get the hell out of here. Yeah, like it's different than the graffiti example, but I grew up, you know, if there was a rail in front of somebody's house, you know, we were gonna ride the rail until we got kicked out. And now as I get older, like I live in a nice area, and. My my jaw would hit the floor if I saw somebody skateboarding in one of my neighbor's yards, you know? And I could never imagine in a million years. Like, the closer you get to being that person, the harder it is to justify. And even we, we uh, when we had the store on Melrose, we got a, we got a billboard across the street. And, like, three days later, somebody did some, uh, a throw-up over it. And it was kind of a bummer because it was terrible. And I was like, you fucking ruined our billboard for that. Yeah. But we spent $5,000 for you to do that on it. But at the what same time, you yeah. yeah, you got to respect it. Like, what the fuck? I guess that's what you guys do around here. And really, it's like that billboard is way too accessible from the roof. Like, if like I, I would never pay for a billboard like that again just because it was like, it's just too easy. It's like you're fucking right there. I could I could get up there in five minutes if I wanted, you know? Yeah, buy your ad on one of them billboards with the razor wire. Yeah. <laughs> is there a lot of that these days? Uh, around, around here, yeah. 
Mm. I see I see razor wire in a lot of places where people are thinking of climbing. Yeah, because once a billboard gets hit 20 times, they probably get pretty frustrated and yeah. got to do something about it, huh? Um, so when you come out to California, what is your analysis of the graffiti scene from what you can tell? It's huge. Yeah. Like, the, the, this city's crushed. During the pandemic, the fucking freeways that I hadn't seen really hit up that much in years became like everything. Like everybody unreal. came out. The um, the pandemic brought so many people out of retirement, or mm -hmm. like you know, the, some of the rules relaxed. Some of the um, as as a writer, like my life didn't change as much as most other people's when the pandemic hit because I was already like in the habit of avoiding people and wearing a mask so mm. it wasn't but hard. it became a lot more normalized to wear a mask where all of a sudden you could walk down the street exactly. wearing a mask and nobody would think shit about it as a graffiti writer that's about the best thing that could happen i was wearing my respirator into whole food <laughs> <laughs> yeah exactly and you just look like you're you know really really trying to avoid covid yeah exactly Damn. so um so yeah it was, and and then all the other side stuff I had going on got shut down for mm. the pandemic, so I painted twice as much. And it's a weird state of affairs where I even I saw something with the the mayor in New York City just acknowledging straight up, like we don't really have, uh, you know, we're not sending anybody out to cover up your graffiti. We've kind of given up. It's just there's no resources for it. We're just not treating yeah. this like it's an emergency anymore. And for somebody who loves graffiti, you're just kind of hearing that like. Oh wow! Like I didn't even know it was possible for you to say something yeah. that reasonable. Like like in the '90s, we never could have imagined a city having that kind of attitude towards graffiti. Yeah, mm -hmm. I mean, it, the, what I'd like to add is it was never an emergency in the first place. I mean, right. you know, but um, but yeah, we we just kept pushing. <laughs> yeah, as a culture, we just keep pushing. It's just weird to like because even when I talk to dudes out here, they're like you know, the level of attention that this shit gets. Like when I did the MTA interview, they were just straight up like, bro, it's not like it used to be. Like they're just not out to get us in the same way. doesn't mean you can't get caught, but you're going to have to fuck up a lot harder. It's probably city to city too. Yeah. Yeah, it, it varies. There's, well, that's there's, true, yeah. there's still some uptight cities that just don't want to see it. Yeah. You go downtown LA, I mean, it's anything nice. goes down there. Yeah. You got people dying in front of you. I mean, it's got to be kind of low on the list of priorities, but yeah. out, up here... I mean, if, if you were to start, if you do 10 fucking throw-ups out here, oh, they are talking about you at that police station. <laughs> like, yeah. you're going to be a big conversation for yeah. sure. Yeah. So, okay, where do you guys uh, see this going from here? Like, like, do you have any particular goals that you want to accomplish uh, before you uh, end the graffiti chapter of your life? And do you think it will end, or do you think you'll be doing this when you're 80? I will be, for sure. Always just, like, walking the train lines like tagging right right not stuff with a silver uni yeah or <laughs> marco yeah. yeah what was the dude with the the little sombrero guy herbie or but the the the, the... moniker is like a, a yeah the mon monic the old moniker on the freight trains yeah, of the, but what of did the it dude say? taking a siesta yeah what what, what did it, it say it was, it was just herbie Herbie, I feel like there was something else that they, they would write next to it that maybe I'm forgetting, but I can't remember. Well, he he was a real Herbie was a rail worker, and he did monikers um, for I don't know like 50 years, like up to his death in I think 1995. That's badass. And and then um, by then people had people like revered his moniker as like, oh, this guy got up. Like this is one of the OG moniker dudes right. for for freights. So um, some people started to do tribute sketch. They do his sketch. They just do a it wasn't counterfeit because it was a tribute right but they do his sketch and maybe write something else below it um uh, my buddy the solo artist likes to put um that's who i'm thinking the solo put, artist he, he likes but to that's put an interpretation of an older tag you're saying um when when the solo the solo artist has his own moniker okay and he's been doing it for a long time and he's one of the ogs in the the moniker game right um but he also he gives a lot of respect to all the old moniker guys and he'll do little tributes he's done tributes to herbie and other um other um you know big names that have passed away you know any books in particular that kind of talk about that whole moniker game with these sort of simple sketches done in those uh what are they like the wax pens or whatever oil bars yeah yeah, yeah oil bars or uh mark calls um i can't i'm on the spot so i can't think of them right now <laughs> but there but is I, there I is literature about later. this yeah okay. i could give you stuff later if, if i could look it up Yo, yeah i'd like to learn more about that because that's just so fascinating to me like people who kind of like invented modern graffiti before it became invented that they just sort of like had an inkling of what it was going to be like that's pretty yeah. sick yeah the 
Oh, go ahead. I enjoyed, that's what I enjoy doing the most nowadays, is just taking out the, the streak and just walking the whole line and hitting like 60 cars. And then it, it, it's full, fulfilling. Yeah. Yeah. Most of the um, most of the OG like older generation freight heads have a lot of respect for the moniker culture, mm. and we've tried to teach it to the younger generations. And it's like you can't hold back the tide. People are just blasting with aerosol at night. You can barely see some of these old faded monikers, so they just get blasted right over. And it's it's kind of a shame, but it's like it's almost like how do you what what can we even do about it? I'm as careful as I can. I've probably made some mistakes too. I, I was watching like on YouTube. I'm just like randomly it'll show me some fucking graffiti dude and i'll start watching it and i'm watching this dude and he's just like he's, he's german or some shit so he's on some weird euro style or whatever but he, he got like a wall in his backyard and he's just doing a piece making a youtube video about it and then just painting over the same exact wall and then just doing another piece and i was just like you know respect because you you have your own spot and you get to just practice your shit but just painting on the same surface over and over like that would that kill it for you like that just seems like it would be deeply unfulfilling to me uh, the only point of that to me is just like you're practicing or you're trying out a new idea, a new color, a new a new fade or like. But it's practice. Or doing a new not, thing. Not for but YouTube. It's, it's not the real yeah. thing. It's that that's that isn't graffiti when you're when yeah. you're painting a little wall in your backyard. Practice, you know. Yeah, yeah you you can practice. Shooting but. hoops in your yard is not the same as playing in for the championship or playing in any sort of organized league. You know, it's not it's not real in the same way. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, the. Yeah, the um, I actually I also had a, another take on that same idea, which is um, for all I spend on paint, even though I save money on paint, I still spend a lot of money on paint um, and I spend effort. I spend time. You know, a lot of times it's most of the time it's illegal. So um, I, I kind of got tired of like doing legal walls over and over. Mm. And I kind of made a rule where like I actually did this. Um, I painted a stairwell at it. There was a big Halloween party. And like, which was also it was an art show and like a Halloween bash, mm. and we we prepped the spot and I painted this whole stairwell with like my bone heap style, like all the skulls and bones and in like cascading down, like like you know, every square foot of the stairwell covered, and you know the dude who ran the place was a good buddy of ours, and he was like, you know, when you're done, you you if you want to go ahead and do this, you got to roll this white when you're done. I'm like, yeah, yeah, no problem. And then, so the the party was a you know a success, and it was it was fun. And then, of course, I had to come back the next day and start whitewashing all of my shit. And how did it feel? I, I, I got the flicks and all, but I, but I was like, I was I was rolling over my shit. I'm like, this is this is whack. I'm like destroying my own shit, you know? Right. Like, and I I made a and then like I'm. I, I was like all tired and I like actually dropped the roller and the roller just like rolled down the stairs like clunk 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 and like painted the stairs white as it was <laughs> I'm just watching it go down the stairs I'm like I'm never fucking doing this again I'm never like I'm never going over myself right again but it's weird because if it had been somebody else who went over it it wouldn't have felt that bad right because that's inevitable right everything's but, gonna but, go away right but I made I kind of made a rule like you know there's so many blank walls out there why would right. I ever go over myself again so yeah. I, I just, it, it just a little, it, it's just a little quirky thing with me. I just decided from that day forward, I'm never painting directly over myself again. Yeah. I mean, you're painting for the feeling. And at the end of the day, that fucking, the anti-feeling when you like go over it, it's like, if that's going to feel that much worse, that's like why I don't want to do drugs anymore at this point in my life. Cause yeah, it feels good. But then there's the bad part afterwards. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's like, if you're going to enjoy painting, but then there's like, it's really bad going over it part after it yeah, yeah with, with re especially with respect to illegal stuff like if it's real graffiti and i i risked my freedom to do it i'm, I'm not gonna I, I want the maximum runtime out of everything i do so right. i'm gonna let it die a natural death there's no way i would like change it to something else i'll just go do a different spot so when you guys come out to la though how do you approach uh getting up connections Tap in with people and they show, yep. sort of show you stuff rather than you just like finding spots. Yeah, this is my first time in LA. So oh, really? Wow. I've been to San Fran, but damn, never here. Um, I I do a combo. I reach out to to people and network, and then you know a lot of times the people I'm networking with are a little on the older side, and they've got their they've got their kids and their mortgages and their jobs to go to, so. They'll put me on to something, but then I'm on my own the rest of the time while I'm in town, and I'll go hunt around and just 
I, I got a nose for certain types of spots. Mm. I got I got an eye for um, I got nothing to prove anymore in terms of bombing. Like I don't need to be doing heavens or or highways where I might have to run. Mm. Um, I'm I'm past the age where I need to prove that to myself or anyone else. I mean, I've put in a lot of work, so I'm just I'm at a point where I'm like, if I do a spot, if I want to get my name up, I tend to pick a spot that maybe the wall is set back a little from the road. Mm. It's a little easier to do. Cutty spots. Cutty, little yeah. little cutty spots, little places where people might have to walk the tracks or uh, look a little harder or look a little deeper and be like, oh, that dude. Mm. Oh, that dude came through. That's weird. <laughs> I, I, I like that kind of stuff, but I, I I no longer have the urge to like come here and like take over, you know. I feel you. That's what's up. Hey, it was but, great. It was great getting to learn you guys' perspective on all this shit for sure, and to reconnect after yeah, twenty two years. Wild. <laughs> <laughs> One of my first internet links. I met with him way before I ever got pussy off the internet, <laughs> <laughs> which would later go on to become a much more common way of meeting up with people. Nice. Fuck, all right. Well, I appreciate you guys uh, for coming through. Anything we need to know about? Uh, no. Oh, we could do a few shout-outs. For sure, yeah. All, let's, let's hear it. All, all the homies and uh, all our crews, uh, YME, Circle T, 6-3, Six Six three. Three. Uh, my boys in OQB, Bobby and Vinny. Um, Trout Art. Trout Art Supply. Trout Art Supply. And I want to... Um, and uh, I, I especially want to shout out my boy, Learn, the, the founder of Why Me Crew and the first writer I actually ever met in person, linked mm. up with. And I'd also like to um, say rest in peace, um, Zaire, rest in peace, Spree, rest in peace, Mize. They all repped Circle T. And um, rest in peace, Billy, O-R-G, from OQB crew in, uh, in New York. For sure. Well, I appreciate you guys coming on. Thanks so much. Right on. All right, thank you. No Jumper, coolest podcast in the world. Check us out on YouTube, TikTok, Patreon, Instagram, etc. Like, comment, and subscribe. Nojumper.com if you want to support.